The ulna is the medial bone of the forearm. In contrast to the radius, the ulna is more massive at its proximal end where it articulates with the humerus and the head of the radius. For articulation with the humerus, the ulna has two prominent projections. First, the olecranon, which projects from its posterior aspect, forming the point of the elbow, and serves as a short lever for extension of the elbow as it receives the tendon of triceps muscle on its upper surface. Second, the coronoid process, which projects anteriorly and receives brachialis, a powerful flexor of the elbow. The two processes and the notch in profile resemble a wrench as it grips or articulates with the trochlea of the humerus. This articulation mainly allows flexion and extension at the elbow joint. When the elbow is extended, it is lodged in the olecranon fossa of the humerus. The posterior surface of the olecranon is subcutaneous and can be easily palpated. A subcutaneous olecranon bursa lies on it. The subcutaneous bursa is liable to be inflamed by repeated friction. This is called student's elbow. The lateral surface of the olecranon provides attachment for anconius. This is a small triangular muscle on the back of the elbow joint. It arises from the posterior surface of the lateral epicondyle of the humerus and is attached to the lateral aspect of the olecranon. In this plastinated model, you can see the extent of the anconius muscle. It is rather unimportant and some consider it as part of triceps brachii muscle. When the elbow joint is extended, the tip of the olecranon and the humeral epicondyles lie in a straight line. When the elbow is flexed, the olecranon descends so that its tip forms the apex of a triangle. The epicondyles of the humerus form the angles at the base of this triangle. The normal relations between the epicondyles of the humerus and the olecranon are important to know because they might be disrupted in certain elbow injuries, for example, dislocation of the elbow. The medial surface of the olecranon provides attachment for flexor digitorum profundus. Proximal to that, the posterior band of the ulnar collateral ligament is attached. Inferior to the coronoid process is a tuberosity, tuberosity of the ulna, for the attachment of the tendon of brachialis muscle. The coronoid process has a thin lip that provides attachment of the articular capsule. Medially, this lip shows a prominent elevation called the sublime tubercle, which provides an additional attachment for flexor digitorum superficialis. Beneath this sublime tubercle, the anterior band of the ulnar collateral ligament of the elbow is attached. Pronator teres is attached to the medial border of the coronoid process. Note that the flexor digitorum superficialis is attached in continuity from the common flexor origin at the medial epicondyle of the humerus to the sublime tubercle and then the attachment is carried by an arch to the radius where it is attached to the anterior oblique line of the radius. On the lateral side of the coronoid process there is a rounded concavity which is called the radial notch of the ulna. This radial notch articulates with the circumference of the head of the radius. The anterior and posterior margins of the radial notch receive the attachment of the annular ligament of the superior radioulnar joint. The quadrate ligament is attached just below this. The capsule of the elbow joint is attached to the margins of the trochlear notch and the radial notch. Thus, the elbow and proximal radioulnar joints form one cavity. Inferior to the radial notch is a prominent ridge called the supinator crest. Anterior to the supinator crest is a concavity called the supinator fossa. The deep part of supinator is attached to the supinator crest 
and supinator fossa and then wraps around the posterior part of the radius to be attached between the anterior and posterior oblique lines. Thus, when supinator contracts, it rotates the radius in supination. The shaft has a nutrient foramen. Note the direction of the nutrient foramen in both the radius and ulna. It is directed to the elbow. To the elbow I go, from the knee I flee. Summarizes the direction of nutrient foramina in the long bones of the upper and lower limbs. The nutrient foramen of the humerus is another example. The nutrient artery is directed away from the growing end of the bone. The growing end of limb bones is the end at which most of the growth takes place. So the nutrient artery is directed away from the growing end, which is therefore the distal or lower end of the radius and ulna. The shaft is angled laterally to form the carrying angle. This lateral angulation of the shaft is because the medial part of the trochlea is at a more distal level than the capitulum. When the forearm is in the anatomical position, that's to say extended and supinated, the arm and forearm are not in the same line. The forearm is directed laterally, forming a carrying angle between the axis of the radially deviated forearm and the axis of the humerus. Normally, this carrying angle is 5 to 15 degrees away from the body. The carrying angle allows the extended forearm to clear away from the side of the hip during the swinging of the upper limb and while carrying loads, hence the name carrying angle. The shaft of the ulna has a long palpable subcutaneous border that extends down from the olecranon. It marks the boundary between flexor and extensor compartments of the forearm. The subcutaneous border of the ulna gives an uponeurotic origin for flexor carpi ulnaris as well as extensor carpi ulnaris. The extensor surface provides attachment for abductor pollicis longus, extensor pollicis longus, and extensor indices. The flexor surface is located anteriorly and provides attachment for flexor digitorum profundus. Pronator quadratus is attached to the distal part of the flexor surface. The shaft of the ulna tapers down. At the distal end is a small enlargement forming the head of the ulna with a small ulnar styloid process. Remember that the head of the radius is at its proximal end while the head of the ulna is at its distal end. A groove alongside the styloid process lodges the tendon of extensor carpi ulnaris muscle. The head of the ulna forms a rounded subcutaneous prominence that can be easily seen and palpated on the medial side of the dorsal aspect of the wrist, especially when the hand is pronated. Feel this on yourself. The pointed ulnar styloid process may be felt slightly distal to the head when the hand is supinated. Remember that the radial styloid process is larger than the ulnar styloid process and extends farther distally. This relationship is of clinical importance when the ulna and or the radius is fractured. In this x-ray of the wrist joint, the normal relationship of the styloid process of the radius, which is distal to that of the ulna, is seen. In fracture of the distal end of the radius, this relationship is disturbed, and both styloid processes can be seen to lie on the same line. The ulna does not participate in the formation of the wrist joint. The articular surface for the wrist joint is provided by the distal end of the radius, which articulates with the lunate and scaphoid. To the border between the articular surface for the lunate and the ulnar notch of the radius, a triangular fibrocartilage is attached. This fibrocartilage is attached to the ulnar styloid process, thus separating the distal radioulnar joint from the wrist joint. The proximal surface of the triangular disc articulates with the distal aspect of the head of the ulna. Hence, the cavity of the distal radioulnar joint is L-shaped in a coronal section. The vertical bar of the L lies between the radius and ulna and the horizontal bar between the ulna and the articular disc. The articular disc separates the cavity of the distal radioulnar joint from that of the wrist joint. Remember that the cavity of the superior radioulnar joint is continuous with that of the elbow joint. 
So while the superior radio ulnar joint communicates with the elbow joint, the distal radio ulnar joint does not communicate with the wrist joint.